in Psalm 139, verse 16. And it says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I've been thinking and praying on what to share with all of you today. Um, I've known for a couple of months that I was going to be sharing again. And I always try to think of things that have been happening in my own life or things that God has been showing me just in my own personal Bible study time and think about how that may apply to others. And I'm still learning through Jaden and all that he has been through. And last time I shared here, it was all about Jaden's testimony and expecting God to show up in all of our situations and in all of our lives. So I was reflecting on that and I was thinking about um, our daughter Lily and all that she has gone through. And Lily is one of Jaden's older sisters, for those of you that don't know. Um, and she had quite an extensive surgery when she was younger. And this was several years ago, and during that time, I kept a blog where I would share updates about Lily and also share things that God was speaking to me at that time. And Holy Spirit reminded me of something that he showed me about scars. And I want to share that with you today as our jumping off point for this message. Lily and Jaden both have scars that you can't see. Lily's is hidden because it's underneath her clothes, and Jaden's is hidden because it can only be revealed through an MRI. And I was remembering back to when Lily had her surgery, and she has quite a large scar on her stomach. And after she had her surgery, we would often get comments like, you know, wow, you can't even tell she had surgery, or you would never know that she had gone through anything which is great. I mean, she's a tough little girl, she's strong, and by the looks of her, you wouldn't know anything had happened until the wound was revealed. And you couldn't see the wound because we covered it with a pretty dress, and we discovered the best ways to hide it. We had lots of pretty dresses and long shirts for Lily to wear. So unless I said something like, oh, you should see what's hidden underneath, no one would know. And that led me to thinking about emotional scarring. It's far easier to hide emotional scars because the naked eye can't see it. But I also think it makes it far easier to hold on to them. We can dress them up, we can cover them up, we can hide emotional scars in all sorts of creative ways. With a physical scar, once it fades, it becomes a distant memory. It's something that happened and you've recovered. It becomes a story to tell of how you got that scar. But with an emotional scar, it's easier to hide it and then expose it a little and hide it and then expose it. And if we're not careful, the emotional scar doesn't fade the way it's supposed to. Emotional scars can keep us from leading the life we're supposed to live. We may think things like, well, I can't pursue my dream because I tried and I failed. Or, I can't trust again because that trust was broken. I can't believe in that. Do you know what happened to me? Or do you know what I've been through? And those are all ways that we reopen a wound that should have healed and faded by now. With physical scars, we take extreme care to make it as minimal as possible. With Lily, we were doing treatments twice a day and changing the dressing and washing it and putting on all the special creams. Yet with emotional scars, oftentimes we don't do that. We don't care for them in that way. We let them heal a little and then reopen them, and let them heal a little and then reopen them until sometimes it becomes a bigger scar than it needs to be. And I'm not trying to minimize things that we go through. Emotional scars are just as real and just as painful to go through as physical ones. But after a season of caring for emotional wounds, it's time to let the scars fade. It's time to let them heal, to not reopen them, to not let them become excuses that hinder what God has for your future. You can allow your scars to become a story you tell of God's overcoming power in your life. I believe that in this time that we're in right now, God is saying, let me fade your scars. And in only the way that he can, he will. One evening, uh, we were flipping through TV channels, and we got drawn into watching this show about tattoos gone wrong. 
Okay, now stay with me. I'm making a point here. <laughs> but um, it was all about people coming in with these horrible tattoos that they wanted the artist to rework into something beautiful. Some of them were misspelled words. Um, some were supposed to be, like, I don't know, a butterfly or a bird, but it looked nothing like what it was supposed to be. Um, and it was actually amazing to see what these artists were able to do and how they were able to transform these tattoos. And I thought of this show as I was thinking about scars. And I thought, you know, a scar can be rewritten in the signature of Jesus. Lily wouldn't have survived in China. Those were the words her surgeon spoke to us. So when I see Lily's scars now, I see hope for a great future. I see a restoration and a redemption in her life. Because the scars she has, those words the doctor spoke, it's all been rewritten in the signature of Jesus. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. When I picture Jaden's scar on his brain from the stroke that he had, I see the words, expect God because his scar has been rewritten in the signature of Jesus. Everything that doctors said could be wrong or could potentially stay wrong with him, God stepped in and rewrote with his narrative for Jaden. Years ago, our first daughter, Madeline, was two years old, and we were ready again to add to our family. But instead, um, as many of you here know, because you were with us during that time, I had miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage and on and on. And emotional scars were definitely building up on my heart during that time. Uh, words were being written on me during that time like failure, hopelessness, bitterness, resentment, grief, sadness, until I allowed Jesus to come in and rewrite those words with his signature. He took those emotional scars that had built up on my heart, and he said, I'm rewriting this into, I work all things for good for those who love me. He taught my heart to hope again when I was feeling very hopeless. I could have easily gone in another direction, but he wouldn't let me. He loves us too much to let us go down that road for long. Many of us have emotional scars that when we look back on them, we can actually feel the pain of it again. There was a time I couldn't talk about my miscarriages without feeling the hopelessness and the sadness of it. When I reflect back to that time now, it's not that I don't remember the pain or the grief or the loss, but those actual feelings don't come back to me. When I look back on it now, I see where God was with me every step of the way, and I can see how he turned it for good. I can see how he redeemed those painful, ugly moments by turning them into something beautiful. So now, those emotional scars have the signature of Christ. Every one of our scars can be rewritten by his signature, his narrative. They can become an identifying mark of him instead of a mark of the wound or of the circumstance. So that when you think back on it, the scar doesn't just remind you of the person that hurt you, or the situation that hurt you, or the injury. You can say, I remember when I got that scar. I remember what a horrible situation it was. But let me tell you, this also reminds me of Jesus. This is when Jesus stepped in and completely transformed my life. Some of us are still wearing the stigma of our past, or shame, or pain, that needs to be turned into the signature of Jesus. We all have scars of some sort, that's just life. We can either be marred by them or we can be marked by them. It's a decision that we can make. It can make a mark on you that identifies you in Christ instead of being identified by the scar. Sometimes the emotional scars we have try to define our hearts with things that just aren't true things that don't line up from the Word of God. One step we can take to help our emotional scars heal is to tune our hearts. Psalm 16, verses 1 through 3, and also verse 7 say, 
Keep and protect me, O God, for in you I have found refuge, and in you do I put my trust and hide myself. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good beside or beyond you. As for the godly, the saints who are in the land, they are the excellent, the noble, and the glorious, in whom is all my delight. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Yes, my heart instructs me in the night seasons. That last line of verse 7 really jumped out to me. My heart instructs me in the night season. The night season, those dark times, those hard times, the times when we may be dwelling on what caused our scars. We have to be so careful of what defines our heart because it's what instructs us and guides us and leads us. When I was thinking of this verse, I thought of the song, Come Thou Fount, which says, Come Thou Fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. That is such an incredible prayer to pray, to say, God, tune my heart. Sometimes we need a tuning. We need to develop our ability to tune in God's voice at all times and also be able to tune out distractions that may block his voice. To tune out all voices of criticism and doubt and unbelief and negativity that come at us every day. When a guitar is out of tune, the song that is meant to be beautiful can sound more like nails on a chalkboard. You know that something's not right, so you have to stop and take the time to gently restore each string to its right place so the song will be beautiful again. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, he wants to restore some of your heartstrings so that your song can be beautiful again. He wants to get hearts back in tune with what he says. He wants to write over your scars and have you hear what he says about them. I know that sometimes my heart needs tuning. Sometimes in the midst of things that are going on, I can forget his goodness. Sometimes I can forget that there are streams of mercy never ceasing. Sometimes I forget that I'm already accepted and covered and held and known and beloved. And when those things are forgotten, emotional scars can reopen. Did you know that if you put two grand pianos in a room and play a note on one of them, the corresponding string in the other piano will begin to vibrate? I want the note that God is playing to resonate in my heart. John 1.1 1, 1 says that he is the sound of the world, the word who was in the beginning with God and who was God. So you can allow your scars to become a story you tell of God's overcoming power in your life. You can let it become a testimony of how God reversed something not of him that was trying to define you. During the season when we were really struggling to have another baby is when God began to speak to me about making things beautiful in his time. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. I recently read this quote, It has been a beautiful fight, and it still is. I feel like that's how it's been with so many of my life experiences. The word fight means to contend in battle or physical combat, to strive to overcome, to put forth a determined effort, to wage, carry on, to take part in, to struggle, to endure or surmount, to gain by struggle, as in fights his way through. And the word beautiful means having beauty, having qualities that give great pleasure or satisfaction to see, hear, think about, delighting all the senses or mind. It also means excellent of its kind. It means wonderful, very pleasing, or satisfying. And when I looked up the word beautiful in Ecclesiastes 3.11, it means fit in harmony with the whole work of God. It also means that all things considered it could not have been done better. So many times we can feel like we're in the fight of our lives, and oftentimes fights leave scars. But if it's in his timing, then it's in God's perfect harmony, and that means there is no better way. And we don't have to be marred by the scars we get. 
we can be marked with the signature of Christ. Isaiah 61 3 says, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. God wants to give you beauty for ashes. And I think we concentrate on the beauty aspect of that verse, but unless you give him your ashes, you don't get the beauty. There is an exchange involved here. There is a plan that where you give him your ashes, he in return gives you his beauty. The definition of ashes is simply the remains of something destroyed. In other words, it is finished. Whatever the ash may be, it is done. Whatever caused your emotional scars is done, and there's no reason to continue hanging on to it. Once we give our ashes to him, our wounds, our emotional scars, he can start making those beautiful exchanges. He can give you a joyous blessing instead of mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, and ultimately bringing all glory to him. So as we were in our season um, of still struggling with having another baby, and we were trying to see how he was turning this for good, Holy Spirit began to place adoption on our hearts. And we really began talking about it and praying about it. And we ultimately came to the realization that this was always supposed to be part of our story. It was always going to be our family's destiny. We just didn't know it. But God knew. He knows our days from the beginning to the end. And he always knew that this was going to be part of our story. He was able to turn what was seemingly an ugly situation into something beautiful with the adoption of Lily. And then once we had adoption on our hearts and we took that leap of faith, he rewrote failure into blessing. And not only were we blessed with our daughter Lily, but we were also blessed with another pregnancy and we had our son Jude. Then we adopted again, and we got the blessing of our son Jaden. And now we have four amazing children. He rewrote devastating losses into abundant blessings. And we began fulfilling and walking out our family's destiny and allowing him to write his signature on our lives. God was able to redeem those ugly moments and I feel like he wants to redeem some ugly moments for some of you today, too. Ask him, what can you teach me through this? Not what are you teaching me through this? I know it's just a slight difference, but we don't want to imply that he's the author of the bad because he's not. It's Satan who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God has come to give abundant life with plans to prosper and to bless. Jaden came in the other day um, after he had been playing outside, and he was upset because some of the kids he was playing with were calling him tiny. And so I asked him if he had ever heard the phrase, tiny but mighty. And he was like, what? I mean, he had no idea what that meant. Uh, and so I explained it to him. You know, I just said, you may be tiny, but that doesn't change the fact that you are so brave and you are so strong, and just was trying to build him up. And, and honestly, it really helped to change his perspective. And now he doesn't really mind being called tiny because I gave him another meaning for it. And in fact, just the other day, he walked into the kitchen and he sat down at the counter and he looked over at Jude, his older brother, who was already sitting there. And he just looked over and he was like, mom told me I'm tiny but mighty. <laughs> you know, he's like got this attitude going on now. And, um, but I think it's great, you know, he doesn't mind it now. He's got a positive um, spin on it. And as his mom, that's what I wanted. I wanted to pull something good from it. I wanted to give him something positive out of it. Well, we have a Heavenly Father who wants to do the same thing for us. Whether we have been called names, whether we have called ourselves those names, he has something different in mind, and he wants to put his perspective on it. He wants to turn it for good, and he wants to write his signature upon your life. We are not defined by what has scarred us. We are defined by our heavenly creator, the one who formed us in our mother's womb, just as we sang this morning. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16 say, 
Oh yes, you shaped me first, inside then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God, you're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration, what a creation. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit, how I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you, the days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. I also want to talk just a little bit today on how brokenness can become beautiful. Broken things are very familiar to our family of six, plus a big dog. And um, there's lots of things and people moving around and activity going on in our house. And if certain broken pieces are able to be fixed, um, they normally find a temporary home on our kitchen counter, just awaiting some super glue repairs. But sometimes they just get tossed away if unable to be neatly pieced back together. Often it takes too much work to fix what was broken and it's easier to just buy a new one. Some of us may feel that way today. Some of us may have broken, written as a scar on our heart, or the word shattered, or tossed aside. The mindset of our culture whispers, don't let anyone see the broken flaws. So we hide those emotional scars. It could be broken families, broken marriages, broken relationships, broken dreams, broken lives. In Japan, they've made an art out of restoring broken things. It's an ancient practice called kintsugi, meaning golden joinery or to patch with gold. It's an age-old custom of repairing cracked pottery with gold, not only fixing the break, but greatly increasing the value of the piece. The heart of it all is turning what is broken into beautiful, cherished pieces by sealing the cracks and the crevices with lines of fine gold. So instead of hiding the flaws, Kintsugi artists highlight them, creating a whole new design and bringing unique beauty to the original piece. The pottery actually becomes more beautiful and valuable in the restoration process because though it was once broken, it not only has history, but it has a new story. While most normal repairs of broken things hide themselves, like nicely sealed superglue fixes, the usual intent is simply to make something as good as new. Yet the art of Kintsugi reinforces a profound belief that the repair can make things not only as good as they were before, but better than new. Better than new. There are lies from our enemy that swirl around and whisper to your deepest soul in those dark, weak moments. When you've lost your grip and things come crashing down and you feel the need to hide the scars, you feel like the brokenness has rendered you useless in your life. You may feel beyond repair this time. You may feel tossed aside or forgotten or shamed or rejected. Yet God breaks through all that mess. You are never beyond healing. You are never too broken for restoration. You are never too shattered for repair. Do not be ashamed of your scars, of those deep crevices that line your soul, or of the broken places in your life. They have an amazing story to tell. Here is the truth today. Just because we've been broken doesn't mean that we are thrown away. Just because we've been broken doesn't mean that we are unusable. Just because we've been broken doesn't mean that we are forgotten. Brokenness has the power, unlike anything else, to bring forth new beauty, strength, and inspiration to others. Because it's often in those moments that we have tasted deep suffering, that we noticed we were made for more, that there's more, that there's purpose, the scars of life, the healed wounds, the deep lines, they all have stories to tell. Yet often we try to hide them away, preferring instead to present to the world just a safe facade of who we are or a more perfect version. It's sometimes too difficult to risk the real vulnerability of exposing what once was or perhaps even what still is. 
but we have a healer. We have one who repairs, who can fit the broken pieces that no longer seem to fit right into a perfect design. He works often behind the scenes, mending, fitting together, creating a better work of art more than we ever dreamed possible. He makes all things beautiful, even in the broken, all from his grace. You are not just simply patched back together as he secretly hopes the glue will stick this time. Your repair and healing is never intended to be invisible, but beautifully lined with shining grace through every scar. God fills crevices of our heart now stronger, better, more beautiful than ever before. And that's what his story is really all about, bringing life to what was broken. He was willing to take on the brokenness of the world in exchange for our freedom. Beautiful Savior Jesus, who sets us free. He makes all things new. Revelations 21.5 says, Behold, I am making all things new. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Isaiah 43, 19, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Psalm 147, 3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And then again, Ecclesiastes 3, 11, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Every story is unique. And each story, including yours, is important to God. And this is our promise. Brokenness does not have to be the final chapter. He rewrites. Begin to imagine what you will look like in the hands of your Savior. And this opens the door to hope. It places the pen in God's hand instead of the past or instead of a person or a feeling. It changes your question from what's wrong with me to what miracle does God want to perform in me? He came for you. And that's what we see in Luke 4, 18 through 19. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is not afraid of our brokenness. It was on his heart the day he transitioned from deity to walk the earth on our behalf. You can hold out your hands. You can throw open the doors that so carefully guard your pain. Don't let your past set the boundaries for your future. Give all your broken pieces to God and watch him rewrite your story for good. Watch your scars be rewritten in the signature of Jesus. I've been uh, working on a new song, and I started writing it while Jaden was going through everything. The beginning of Psalm 138.3 says, The moment I called out, you stepped in. And that's such a powerful promise that we can hold on to. When I call out, you step in. And the first two lines of the song are, You taught my heart to hope when all was lost and gone. Sometimes a miracle waits a beat to sing its song. He taught my heart to hope through so many of my life experiences, some that I have shared with you today. And then sometimes a miracle waits a beat to sing its song. With Jaden's healing, we had the promise that he was going to be healed. We had the words, expect God. But we still had to pray it through every day expecting God to show up. His miracle, his healing, didn't just happen as a suddenly. And to me, there's incredible truth in all of this. He comes to us. He sings over us. He doesn't leave us alone when we're walking through things. Psalm 139 says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, and when I rest at home, you know everything I do. You know what I am going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. 
Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness I cannot hide from you. To you the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and come up. When we call out, he steps in. And he says over us, and this is Isaiah 55, 8 through 11, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. It is the same with my word. If I send it out and it always produces fruit, it will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. What he writes on us, his words, his signature, that's what has life-producing power. God, I thank you for your word that is true, for your word that never changes. I rebuke every lie of the enemy, and I say that God's word alone stands over us and speaks life to us. I thank you, God, for scars that are fading. I thank you, God, for beautiful exchanges that are being made in your presence today. And I thank you, Lord, for heartstrings that are being restored to you. Keep our hearts in tune with yours, with what you say, God. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your faithfulness. God, we honor you and we bless you today. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.